Biker TV is brought to you in part by the Canadian Biker Build-Off, July 29th to 31st. Rockies Harley-Davidson, 50 years of delivering the dream. Mid-USA, just hard parts. Closed captioning by Task Productions. So, you want to go fast? Welcome to Biker TV, the best of the V-Twin world. An action-packed half hour filled with bikes, babes, parties, and rock and roll. Doesn't get much better than that. I'm Heather Ireland. And I'm Viva. Today's show is almost too hot for TV. Too hot for TV? We've got Donnie Peterson walking us through the history of the Harley engine. And we meet a group of righteous bikers and veterans for the POW MIA Poker Run. Then there's one of Canada's best-known tattoo artists, Scott McEwen. Hottie Heather and the Hamilton Hog Chapter take us for a turkey run. <laughs> but first we check out Dino and the guys getting down and dirty at the track. Okay, we're ready to go racing now. This is when we find out who's got what it takes to get that bike down the track and who can cut that perfect light, who can do that perfect launch, and who can get to the end of the track first. Bragging rights are the best thing a man can have when he's got a hot rod early because everybody else is just looking at taillight. This is for the money. I just did it. Draw the first lucky winner out of there for the first round. You draw the other one there, Amanda. Mike? Lindsay picked Lindsay. Yes. And who did you get? Mike. And Pam. Lindsay drew Pam. And Luger. Pam and Luger. Ooh, the big match down. <laughs> Looks hey. like my buddy Fisk will get a buy. Don't yeah. red light. Don't red light. $100, here we go. I got some heavier wheels and rubber on it this year, so it's hooking up better than it was, too. So I also have that going for me. Never count out the silver bike. Don't let up, just beat the shit out of it and have fun. Yeah. As long as you know your bike, you know it'll withstand it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear from a guy who owns a repair shop. fun and uh, so far the money's mine so we'll see what happens we'll see what happens pretty windy out see they're all making excuses why they can't win but the money's on this young man right here unless of course I was racing but I think a grudge match is gonna happen Next week on Battle of the Bikes, we're going to talk about the results of the race. Why didn't the most horsepower win? How important is it for a rider to know his bike? And after that's all done, I'm going to take you on a ride and show you some grassroots stuff that's going to blow your mind. My bike can take all of them. Next, we've got Donnie Peterson walking us through the history of the Harley engine. Hi, I'm Donnie Peterson, and this is Biker TV Tech Line. Uh, I've owned uh, heavy duty cycles here in Toronto for 30 years, and I've been the Tech Line editor for American Iron Magazine since 1989. Today, we're going to 
discuss the evolution of Harley Davidson engines from 1936 to 1984. The flathead, the knucklehead, the pan head, and lastly, <coughs> the shovel head. Well, I understand why they call it a flathead, Don, but how does it work? Well, it is flat, and that's how it got the nickname. If you took all these cooling fins off, it would be a flat piece of metal. But where are the valves? They're not here. This is called a side valve engine. This is a very inefficient design, but it's a Harley workhorse and probably the most reliable engine that Harley ever came out with, Tony. In fact, this head is off a bike that's probably 65 years old. This head will still be on motorcycle 65 years from now, maybe 200 years from now. But it's not very fast, and the reason it's not very fast is because of the, the combustion chamber design, very poor flame travel, very low percentage of burn. I mean, this is a real pollution monster. Donnie, how come this one's so heavy? Well, Tony, it's made out of cast iron steel. Why it's called a knucklehead becomes pretty obvious. There's big knuckle nuts that go on the end here, and uh, Harley riders are always giving nicknames to, to each other, to their motorcycles, and to the engine configurations. Now the problem with the three engines, the knucklehead, the panhead, and the shovelhead, with the hemispherical combustion chamber, with the hemihead piston, is that once the piston comes up into the combustion chamber and the spark plug goes off, spark plug's located right here, how does that poor spark get around that dome? There's gas on the other side of this spark plug on this side of the combustion chamber that will not burn. A panhead engine this is called, Don. Uh, looks like you can fry eggs with the top. Is that why it's called that? Well, the panhead engine, pan heads, these are made out of tin and uh, if you take them off they look just like a pan and that's of course uh, how it got its name. The reason they went to this engine over the knucklehead, it's not a huge improvement over the knucklehead but an improvement nonetheless. The, uh, the heads are made out of aluminum so they're lighter. It's also an easier engine to work on because the knucklehead is, uh, they're leakers. They leak oil all the time. It's very difficult to stop them. The pan head, uh, it didn't leak oil as much, but like all Harleys of the day, it certainly marked its spot. I heard old shovels never die. Don, is that true? Well, they die repeatedly, but they're rebuildable forever, like the flathead. Um, it's, it's an engine that you have to be a mechanic if you want to own for any length of time. Uh, the improvement of this engine over the pan head Again, it's not very dramatic, the same as the pan head over the knucklehead, but the, the head is made out of aluminum and this dampened noise. These tin pans on the pan head, they transfer a lot of valve train noise. So the shovel head became a quieter engine. The intakes on the shovel head, where the air and gas is uh, fed into the head, they're again another improvement. Anything that improves the flow of air into the heads on any engine will make the engine run more efficiently and also faster. This is Donnie Peterson for Biker TV Tech Line. Next week we're going to get into the modern Harley engines from 1984 to 2004, the Evolution and the Twin Cam 80. Hey you, yeah you, don't go away, Biker TV will be right back. Welcome back to Biker TV. In the tattoo world, Scott McEwen is a true leader on top of his game. Just watch. I've known Scott McEwen for quite a few years now. He's been at every convention I've started since 98. Scott's part of the ebb and flow of, uh, of South Pacific influence tattooing with him. terrified when I did my first tattoo. I couldn't stop shaking. I think I did like a little tribal design on a friend. None of the lines matched up. He's not my friend anymore. <laughs> guy who taught me how to tattoo, he said if I did Japanese tattooing I'd pretty much be able to work forever, I'd be busy forever. Japanese tattooing is really hard to learn, but there's so many little things in Japanese tattooing that can make or break it. If you don't know the formulas to it, it can look really bad. It's really hard to draw something like a dragon compared to an image that's on the wall. 
to draw it correctly. A lot of classic tattooing is done spontaneously. People walk in, they see a design, looks great, I'll get that or something like it. Whereas a Japanese tattoo is usually something quite big, something like a full sleeve. People have to come in, you trace their arm, they talk about what they want, then usually they give it up to you to kind of draw the design in your style. I like the full body look. Instead of look, classic American tattooing looks great, but it's kind of slapped on in pieces rather than one theme going through. In some way, it looks classier. People I tattoo now, they trust me, I think because I've just seen lots of my tattooing. Um, they come with an idea. I still do what they want to do. They're paying me, so they want my art but I'm using their idea. Well, I chose this design because I like the tribal tattooing. I like the black and white uh, designs. And I did some research and saw some Maori ones and really liked it. So I talked to Scott and he drew it for me. And here we are. <laughs> it's all tribal with um, a negative pattern. So usually most tribal stuff's got a, a black pattern in the foreground. This is the opposite. It's been fun doing Linda's tattoo. It's the first big Maori tattoo I've done because I'm from New Zealand. I'd like to have one big Maori tattoo um, that I've done in my portfolio. So Joseph Banks it was a naturalist on board Captain Cook's ship, the Endeavour, in 1759, and. Uh, when he sailed into Tahiti, he saw the way they were tattooed, and he wrote in his journal, I shall now mention the way they mark themselves indelibly, and everyone is marked according to their humor or disposition. And I'm paraphrasing, but I believe that it was true 300 years ago, and it's true today. The circus sideshow days of tattooing as an exhibit are kind of long gone, and then even the, even the white culture days, they're still here. Tattooing in that association is still here. But now the, the, the art's been, I wouldn't say elevated, but it's just, it's digressed into so many other genres. I'm finishing a bodysuit on a guy right now. We've been tattooing for the last two years. We've done probably 250 hours on it, and we finished it last Saturday. So you have to get on with the person if you're gonna spend that much time with them. Most satisfying part of tattooing is probably watching the person walk out with a big smile. Most bikers love to party, but often it's about a whole lot more. Canadian veterans have risked their lives defending freedom for us all. Let's meet some bikers and soldiers who put it on the line. My name is Michael Hulley. I'm the National Chairman of the Canadian POW MIA Information Centres. I'm a Vietnam veteran, I've done two tours, and I'm a Canadian citizen. Poker run, okay, well that's when everybody gets together on their bikes, and they go to five different locations. And at least each location they'll either pick up a card, or they'll get a checkpoint stamp. And at the final location, they'll draw five cards. There's too much information that, that's come out in the past 10 years, for example, of live sightings. North Korea said all along, we don't have any prisoners of war. Seven have escaped. A Hungarian just came out of an insane asylum in Russia. So he had been in there 53 years. Now he's back in Hungary. How many more like that? How many more like the numbers? We don't know. registration fee, any sales that we make, any donations we receive, um, any other funds that came in on private donations, all that money goes to the Canadian POWMIN network. It's uh, our second poker run. We've already doubled our numbers. We're doing fantastic as far as poker runs go. Can't complain there. We have strong support with the biker community. 
Uh, where they support us is that they know that this issue exists, so they continually buy the same patches and pins off us at bike shows to support us. And we think that's very admirable. I mean, at some point, they're going to be saturated with pins and patches, but we have nothing else to offer except for information. I myself am not a Canadian Vietnam veteran. I served in the Canadian Armed Forces, but I support all armed forces as far as uh, their dedication to our freedom. And that's what it's all about. They, you know, a young kid, a young woman, off to fight a war, the last thing you want to do is say, okay, you go over there and fight 10,000 miles from home, and if something happens, don't call us for help. The Canadian Legion now has, in Ontario especially, we have one of our chapters out of Sudbury, who is aggressively pushing to get a prisoner of war missing in action flag recognized in all the legions, saying that it's not Vietnam, it's all wars, because there is no national symbol for it. This is the only one we've ever found. We've got our memorial in Windsor because Ottawa refused to recognize Canadian Vietnam veterans. There's over 40,000 that served. We're just basically a big pain in the side of the U.S. and Canadian government and several other ones. And uh, as long as there's breath in our body, we ain't going to stop. You have to honor those who had the courage to go and then come back. And those who did come back. And that's what we're there for, for those that did come home and those who haven't come home. Whatever we do as a group or independent for this effort is, is minimal compared to the sacrifices that are still being made by them. Coming up next, Heather leads the pack and shows us why the turkeys are running in Hamilton. I'm here at Pools Harley-Davidson in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm meeting up with the Hamilton Harley owners group today. They're going to take me on a turkey run. What's a turkey run? I have no idea, but we'll soon find out. We're going through farmland. There's turkeys all over the place. What's a turkey run? Can you explain that? Uh, it's a run that uh, Bill Leslie, who owns Pools, has always put on uh, every year for a lot of his clients. We simply uh, follow the arrows uh, that we post, and uh, there are uh, four checkpoints along the way where a colored piece of paper will be picked up. Then you bring them back here at the end, and uh, you might win a turkey. The funds that we raise will be uh, donated over to the uh, Alzheimer uh, Society of uh, Hamilton and uh, Burlington. So hopefully by the look of things today we're going to have a good turnout and make uh, lots of money for Alzheimer's. the end of the run so they tell us that's what keeps us moving this is my ticket to a free butter ball at the end of the day beautiful turkey run I figured it out <laughs> Lost yet? Almost missed this stop. How can you read this? It's in Nufi language, I think. Orange paper, where does it say that? Oh, here we go. It's pink paper and then 20 back. Don't even bother with the pink paper, I'm taking the bird. Lucky pink paper on the third stop for the quest of the butterball turkey. I'm winning this bird. I don't know, I'm still looking for turkeys. I don't know. Next stop's yellow paper.
the last piece of paper on the quest for the golden butterball. <laughs> I didn't win the turkey today, but I had a great ride with the Hamilton Harley Owners Group. And the guys from Pools Harley Davidson managed to raise $715 for Alzheimer's. If you want Biker TV to show up on your next ride, drop us a line at bikertv.ca. I'm Heather Ireland. Keep the shiny side up, and I'll see you next time. Special thanks to our band of the week, Lowest of the Low, who rocked us with their tune, Concave. And that brings us to the end of Biker TV this week. So we will be back next week with Donnie and his conclusion on the history of engines, Dino and the gang still battle for that top spot, and of course, super sexy Heather leads the pack with our good friends, the Niagara Harley Owners Group. Biker TV is brought to you by the gracious support of many leaders in the motorcycling community. Drop us a line at info at bikertv.ca. See you next week, and remember, if you don't ride in the rain, you don't ride. Special thanks to Centertown Pawnbroker, London's Cash Guys. Time Out Cycles, custom motorcycles, parts, and service. Motorcycle Mojo Mag, it's about the ride.